I used to hitchhike across America, and I always say, you know, that, that looking for financing is like hitchhiking. It could be your first guy who stops. Um, it could be the 20th guy who stops. You have to have the patient, it might be the 100th guy who stops. But you also have to know when you don't get in the car. Um, and, you know, you've had that gut feeling, I'm sure. Yes, and I've gotten into the car. Yes. <laughs> well... And, and sometimes they're very good at saying, hey, you want to ride, you know, and whatever. And you really? don't know that they're a psycho killer until you know, like a month into the production or the editing room. Or yeah, I'd never met psychopaths before. Yeah. How involved are you in the budget? You know, um, very involved in the last several movies and the first several movies because it came out of my pocket. Um, and so usually the limit of the budget is, you know, how much money we have, you know, and, you know, not, not, not putting our house up for a uh, mortgage, but it, it really is, okay, that's the budget. Um, and then Maggie Renzi, who's the producer, and I do a little bit of back and forth, um, usually with somebody who's... Uh, uh, a good production manager and can cost out some things. And the questions that come back are, okay, this three-eighths of a page is costing us 10% of the budget. How important is this three-eighths of a page to shoot at night on this location, which is going to be very, very expensive? And sometimes the answer is, it is that important. Mm -hmm. Other times the answer is, oh, wow, it's going to cost that much for that three. So maybe I can think of another way to tell the story just as well or better that doesn't cost as much. Yeah. And the other thing with us is when, when we haven't financed it from the money that I make as a screenwriter and some of the money we get back from our one or two very successful movies, relatively successful movies, uh, sometimes you just realize the financiers are psychopaths and you know I don't want to spend a year with these people or more do you edit your own movies? do I? edit your own movies uh, I work with an editor always uh -huh. uh, but uh, the process on each film is very different um, my editing process um, I think it runs from the extremes are I, there was one film I did where I was in the editing room when only six cuts were made uh -huh. Uh, that's one extreme, mm -hmm. and the other extreme is I'm saying no, no, another frame, another frame. There, mm -hmm. that's it, that's it. Yeah. And I'm there the whole time, virtually the whole film, doing that. Uh -huh. uh, and that's with the same editor. Uh -huh. um, those extremes exist, mm -hmm. and it's 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 very much about my state of mind with the film. Mm -hmm. And uh, I often think, okay, you, the editor, Tanya, you know this much better than I. Mm -hmm. Okay, you you I'll go away and do this, and you you you, you know you do that. Mm -hmm. But there are things where I've shot it to be to be cut in a very particular way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, rushes are always interesting for me. Mm -hmm. Looking at rushes because uh, I rarely feel the same as anybody else does, uh -huh. um, and so. Uh, we come out of rushes because the whole crew is welcome to come mm -hmm. and the editor and so on. We come out of rushes and people are saying, oh, this is fantastic, this is fantastic. And I'm going, oh, fuck, fuck. <laughs> I didn't get it. I didn't get it. And I know I, know I didn't get it because I can't. <coughs> and other times it looks like it's drivel that's up there. Mm -hmm. But I know I've got this moment and this moment yeah. and this moment. They're the ones I wanted and I'm the only one who's happy. Yeah. And the editor thinks he's mad. Yeah. And then we cut, and it's okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I've I've edited, I think, fourteen of the seventeen films that we've made, and I and I edited my first couple movies, and then I worked with an editor for a couple movies, who I liked, mm -hmm. uh, a couple different editors that I liked, and I worked with the editor kind of like you work with an actor of you know, there's take one, go ahead and do take one, and a few suggestions, do take two, but I never left the room. And I realized, uh, I would say, okay, uh, I'll do the montage sequence and you do the straight cut sequence. And we changed chairs. <laughs> yeah. And finally, I just started feeling like I'm spending more time articulating what I want. Yeah. And I could do it a lot faster if I was sitting down at the bench. Yeah. Um, and then it, it also has continued that, that um, because I edit myself and we're making low-budget films, uh, kind of that last situation you were describing, which is... The actors are saying, whoa, 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 you're moving, can't, we're going to another scene. And I'm saying, yeah, yeah, we're going to another scene. I got what I want. You guys were great. They said, well, but I, I blew a line every take. 
And I have to say, yes, but you blew a different line every take. Yes. Your acting was focused. It was good. I have three angles. I'm not going to put the part where you blew the different line in. I've got it. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, trust me. Mm-hmm. You know, and you mm-hmm. hope that by that point, the actors trust you. You know, you don't need the perfect. It's not theater. You don't need a perfect master shot. Mm-hmm. You don't even need a perfect take. Okay. You need those little pieces, and then you can move on and. If you do three more takes, you're probably not going to get anything new that you don't need. You know? and, and I think that that's, that's the, you know, uh, the recognition. I, have, I tend to go to um, Bailey's because it's a social occasion for the crew. Um, sometimes I don't because I'm just too tired or I have to do my homework. But I, I, I basically see those things on the set, and that's why we move on or don't move on. Um, and, and, and then in the editing room, quite honestly, uh, I'm lucky in that uh, I'm almost always, to support this movie-making habit, writing something for somebody else to make money. And so when I see the footage, it's pretty new to me because I've been working on some other story, you know, on writing some other story. And that's my new world, that footage, you know, and I don't necessarily remember how I got it or whatever. And then you just start from there, rewriting the movie or retelling the movie or giving it a new rhythm. How have you found the the evolution of editing uh, technology? Yeah, that is interesting. I, I the Cohen brothers, who uh, this is a secret, uh, actually edit their own movies under an assumed name, uh, and I were the last guys in New York to edit on flatbed film. And finally, what happened is if anything went wrong with your flatbed, you couldn't get it fixed. Um, flatbeds and uh, upright moviolas were starting to, sh- to show up in restaurants as like conversation pieces and stuff like that. These are great looking machines. Um, and uh, I, I think what happened to the Cohen brothers actually is on 9-11, their, their editing room was near the thing and the ceiling fell down on theirs which was a huge machine, and so they just decided, okay, it's time to go digital. And, uh, and I just couldn't get machines anymore. Yeah. And so uh, a friend of mine who had actually cut uh, eight men out for me, uh, who now runs the graduate program at NYU, gave me a half-day lesson on digital. And what I realized is that you make the same decisions. Um, I know the footage really well, and I, I figured it out the first couple days that I probably was spending an hour a day on an eight-plate machine changing reels. And that's an hour a day that I get to do something else, swim, play basketball, watch TV, don't, don't change reels. Mm-hmm. Um, so I like it, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, it's kind of like a video game. But basically the decisions are the same. Uh, you do, if, editors who like to see the footage forward and backward, you can do that. You can also jump around more. And I find I jump around, you know, I don't, I don't need to see it forward and backward a million times because I know it so well. You know, I was there when it was shot. Yes. Um, I think editors, I know editors who had a hard time going from one to the other yep. because their thought process had to change yep. just, just in, in what was in front of their eyes. It was difficult for me because of the thinking time mm-hmm. was so radically reduced. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the time it takes an editor to make a cut, to, you know, to cut yeah, the thing yeah. and, uh, the, uh, and to wind back, so, I think, I think, I think, mm-hmm. I think, and then that's gone. It's like, maybe yeah. it's gone. Sorry, you've, what, you've done it already? Yeah. Okay, you know, no, I didn't even see it yeah. because it's too fast. Uh, but eventually you, you, yeah. you adjust. Yeah. And, and the great thing is also uh, you can get, you know, when you have to... Um, even though yeah, I have assistant editors usually, uh, you cut a sequence together and you say, well, that's interesting, but there might be a whole different way to put it together. Back when you had to put tape on everything, you were less likely to say, okay, uh, remember where all these cuts are, let's t- tear it all apart and start all together. On digital, you can just save that version. You know, Do another version, do a third version, and look at them, you know, and judge them against each other. So it is a great tool in that way, you know, the kind of, I, I'm old enough that in my, in my writing, um, I remember not only, you know, manual typewriters, but carbon paper, you know, the carboniferous age. 
And uh, I, I literally, when I started writing screenplays, would cut and paste, you know, and the, the lines wouldn't be quite, you know, really, because I wasn't that good at cut and paste. Uh, and then all those, you know, computer, uh, you know, screenwriting format things came along, and it was just great. I, I was, you know, I, I found myself um, being a less lazy rewriter, um, basically because uh, I could just push buttons instead of having to do all that cutting and pasting or retyping or, or whatever. So, the, you know, technology is just a tool. And it's like I, um, Amigo is the first movie that we shot in digital. Um, shot it with, with red cameras. Luckily, um, it was like the 21st generation of red camera, not the first, so we didn't have to wrap it in nice packs or anything like that. And the cinematographer had worked with it enough. I knew a little bit more about it. You could use film lenses with it. So you could get something much more like a film look, the look that I wanted with it. And then there were certain things you just had to watch out for that, that will never be the same in digital, you know, pointing at a sky or something like that. Um, but it's just a tool. Mm-hmm. And the, the great thing for it has been the salvation of documentary makers who, you know, over the years, half or three quarters of their expenses are film stock, especially if it's a story that goes on for years and years and years. And now with digital, you just shoot stuff, and if it's no good, you can, you know, race it, shoot over it, whatever, but it just doesn't cost you a huge part, percentage of your budget yeah, yeah, anymore. Yeah. Um, yes, it's, it's what I've found is, is quite different. Uh, is film stock and lab and processing has always been the lower the budget the film, the higher the proportion yeah. of, of the film that it is. And now, of course, if you're careful with that, because some people, you know, in the end you can cause a lot of expense by overshooting and, mm-hmm. and time, but if you're careful with it, um, it's not remotely the issue anymore mm-hmm. uh, that it used to be. Have you ever written a movie with a, a specific actor in mind? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have written for uh, an actor. Um, you know, I rang him up beforehand and said, uh-huh. I'm going to write this pretty dark thing. Uh-huh. Um, and Are you I, interested? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and there was a movie that I was writing which I had, had worked out what the film was going to be with a particular actor mm-hmm. and he was always going to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, various things happened to him <laughs> in his life, um, which then made me doubt that he would do it. And I rang him up and said, look, you know, um, I, I'm halfway through. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so he read the first half. And I said, and he said, oh, well, I don't know if I can do that anymore. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, he said, look, you know, do I have to take this literally? It's a film called Bad Boy Bubby. Um, and I said, assume that what is written is what you have to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he said, no, nah, can't do it. Mm-hmm. And, and then I couldn't write anymore mm-hmm. until I found somebody else to do it. Uh-huh. Um, which just, just because you felt like um, it would be crazy to write this thing no. and then have to go look for something? No, I needed, I, 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 needed, I needed to know uh-huh. the person, the, 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 the character almost, the actor character, um, to be able to continue to write uh-huh. because it was, yeah, it was somehow based. Uh, I needed needed to know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. When I when I was starting out as a screenwriter for hire, um, I I sometimes would write with characters in mind, and the studio people would say, "So, so who do you see in this role?" <laughs> and I was often saying Spencer Tracy, you know, who had been dead for fifteen years, and uh, and there and then they thought and they said, "You know, there's not another Spencer Tracy. We don't have one of those anymore." And then I started realizing that. Um, you know, even if they were friends of mine, they're not necessarily available. They can't necessarily afford to work for me again, mm. whatever. So, so pretty soon I started really trying to say, I don't know who's going to play this thing. Mm. I'm going to write a great part or an interesting part or whatever, and then <coughs> I'm going to read it like, you know, I didn't write it and try to think of the interesting actors mm. who, who might play this. Um, especially because I, I tend to like to hire really good actors and cast them in something I haven't seen them specifically do before. And, and, and that makes it more interesting for them and more interesting for me. You know, if, I've, if I've seen them do that thing, 
You know, I've had actors come up, why, why didn't you even have me come in and read for that? And I said, I've seen you do it before, and you did it very well, but I didn't want to see you do it again, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and, and I'll work with, you some, with something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and you, you're casting right now um, yes, for something. Yes. Um, do you rely on a, 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 a casting director, or do you, do, you, do you start with maybe two or three names in your head already? Um, well, it's, I've, I've worked with a casting person for years here in Adelaide, um, and, and, um, but she has moved on to um, the great casting uh, couch in the sky. Um, and so now I'm working with a new casting director in Sydney, which mm-hmm. and it's a whole different sort of uh, way to look at things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I must say that I'm not... Uh, because I don't watch television, mm-hmm. uh, and when I when I make a film, I tend not to see very many films. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm out of touch with with a whole range of actors who I mm-hmm. should be in touch with, and so I really can't do it well by myself anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just grappling with how this works um, because I thought we were getting close with the five or six good suggestions for a particular mm-hmm. character, but then another 15 turn up. Uh-huh, yeah. And then I think, oh, now I'm getting confused. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah our, our last movie, Amigo, I realised, uh, for some of the same reasons, I just had lost track with white guys under 30. Okay. And I needed all these American soldiers. You know, I just didn't know that genre. I'd, I'd uh, just done Honey Dripper, and there's almost no white guys in it. Um, you know, I'd done it in a couple of movies with... A lot of women in them and whatever. I just didn't know those actors. And uh, the casting director first sent us the reels of all the guys who are getting work. Mm-hmm. And it was mostly TV stuff. Um, literally every third one was a CSI show. So they were in the orange uniform or whatever. And said, no, I didn't kill my sister or whatever. You know. um, and it was depressing. Um, first of all, because the acting wasn't very good. And the shows were mostly really bad. Um, And uh, then we said, well, we maybe have to dig a little bit more. And so she sent some more stuff. And then finally, I was just feeling like, geez, there must be much better actors. Um, We said, start sending us the resumes of people who have only done theater or very little TV or whatever, which was a totally different world. This was an L.A. casting person. Um, And what it meant is I had to see a lot of people. You know, kind of eliminate the ones who is, well, that person just, you know, doesn't work for whatever reason from their reel, but still see a lot of people, maybe see them first on tape because they were on a different coast or whatever and narrow that down and then just bring people in and see them. And I tend to act with them. I tend, I play another, so they're looking at me. Um, some, usually I have them do it a couple times. Sometimes I'll give them a direction as a director. Sometimes I'll just feed them a totally different character in my acting with them and see if they, you know, adjust with that. Um, but it's so exhausting. Um, and there is that problem of, um, okay, somebody came in who was just terrific, but we've got 45 more people to see. see. Chris Cooper, who's the lead in Mate One, and I've worked with a bunch of times, had never done a movie. Uh, came in to read for the lead in Mate One, the first guy who came in. Wonderful reading. Okay, great. I've got, you know, eight more guys coming in today. We're going to see about 40 people for this. We saw all these people, and we said, yeah, the Press Cooper guy was pretty good, but there's some other people who are pretty good about thinking that. And then all the money fell apart for the movie. Three years later, we got the money. Um, and, and you know we thought some of the scale of it or whatever, but we we, we knew we had the money. But uh, an actress who I actually offered the lead had been killed in a car crash. You know the kids we had read were too old. Um, you know things happen. Uh, and well, there was that, that guy Chris Cooper still had never been in a movie or TV show. Um, and once again he came in first, which was such a disadvantage. But he was so good, and you know, and I was luckily an independent filmmaker. I could cast an unknown as the lead in my movie, and even though there were some known guys who came in and read for it, read fairly well, we just kept coming back to that guy. And there was the only question was, you know, he's so serious, can he smile? 
<laughs> and, you know, we, he'd been recommended by a friend of ours who's has since become a filmmaker who, who he'd been in her student film at NYU and stuff like that. And can he smile? Oh, he's a very serious guy. I just liked him so much. And I read the script through and I realized he doesn't have to smile. <laughs> Not in this movie, you know, so it doesn't matter at all. Let's cast the guy, you know. And he was, it was just great, you know. Yeah. But it's that it's really hard to be the first guy in yeah. when there's a big long list. Yeah. It's hard to remember who he was. And so we've started taping. We, we didn't have tape back then, but we've started taping just so we can go through and say, oh, geez, Jesus, geez, geez. oh, no, that guy, that guy was good. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe we have to bring him in again. Well, you, you sort of started off as an actor, though. Yeah. And, yeah. and that you can act with him must be a fantastic thing. Yeah, you know? it, it, it helps, and it, it helps keep me in the game, because, you know, is, is one of the, you know, this is, you know, we were having him do this big, long speech. Well, write a speech that you love of your own and think is a good speech, but then hear it 58 times. <laughs> it doesn't sound any good anymore, mm -hmm. you know, and it's very hard to have it come alive. And so what you realize is that you may have slept walked, sleepwalked through about six performances, and then all of a sudden you're paying attention. You say, well, who's this guy? Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard this thing 20 times today, and I'm actually listening again. Um, you know, so there, there is that other, that fatigue factor. And, and, and is, am I listening because he's doing it really badly or really eccentrically? Or is it because he's really nailing it and I feel like it's really happening again? Mm -hmm. um, occasionally, a, another thing I'll do um, with new actors, especially kids, is um, not have them actually read from the script. Uh, or sometimes not actually read at all when I'm casting kids. If I, if I get to make more movies, I, I, so far I haven't done it. I have never had to work with a professional kid. Um, professional kids have done a lot of commercials. They've got the cute gene or they went to cute school or whatever. And, it, and they come with professional kid parents. And <laughs> life is too short. So we usually are, you know, we find kids or they're kids of people we know and it's a small part or whatever um, who haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and what I find is to know if somebody is a good actor, you're not asking if they're a good reader or not. And some kids are great actors who don't read very well. The same thing with, with older people. They, they don't see well anymore. Uh, there's some very, I, I think uh, it might be Nick Nolte and some other actors in Hollywood who are somewhat dyslexic, who have to memorize their lines or they're going to be terrible. I work with Michael Rooker. Um, who had been in one movie when I cast him for Eight Men Out, and the casting director knew this about Michael, that he was dyslexic. And they said, he's going to be pretty bad in this. He just got this stuff. Uh, let him come back. If, if you're at all interested, let him come back, because he'll memorize it tonight with some help, and he'll be great. And he was terrible in the first one. And it was just the dyslexia, because he was doing a cold reading. And he came back, and he had learned the thing, and he was great. I cast him. Um, but with kids, I very often try to make some kind of, I've done this, you know, I, I speak Spanish okay, and I've done this with Mexican kids in, in a couple of our movies and, and with American kids, is invent a game that's a storytelling game that uh, has a physical part to it, usually so they don't have to worry about what they do with their hands or whatever. You know, it'll be, okay, uh, I'm going to tell you a story, and then I'm, I'm going to make you a character in the story, and you're going to answer some questions. But while you do that, you know, take all the chairs from there and put them on that table. Or uh, I'm going to play this game with you guys, and you see those phone books on the floor, you're going to walk on those phone books, and if you walk on the floor, there's alligators, and they're going to eat your foot off. And they're hard. They're, you know, so they're, they've got something to do, but they're also relating to you. They can tell a story. They can, they, they can answer. And you get a sense of whether these kids can do something and whether they're listening and, and all those kind of things. And some kids have that talent and never lose it. Some have it for a while and lose yeah. it, whatever. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it's come to be such a, a better way to find people with some act, acting, especially locally, mm -hmm. um, who aren't professional actors, than that thing of having people come in and, and read from the script. Um, it's always, it's, there's such an incredible alchemy of somebody who can be very animated and everything like that, and the minute you put words on a page in front of them, they, it just goes, and they, they just turn into a rank amateur.